as they do, we'll welcome them. So welcome everybody to uh, this evening of the, the series here, here is Elsewhere, which is now this particular one is again hosted and sponsored by the Literary Translators Association of Canada. Um, we really do thank them for their generosity and um, and for you know for their trust in, in in taking this to the next step. So we're getting better and better. Um, I'd like to uh, also thank the Canada Council for the Arts, which uh, subsidizes the Literary Translators Association. I'd like to thank Alex for his um, for his expertise in inviting us and managing the whole thing. And I encourage you to. Um, to join the association. Uh, there are many categories that you can join. You don't have to be a, a, a translator or there is a, a category for associate members and all of this supports our work in, in um, as translators, but also in um, disseminating international literature and translation or Canadian literature and translation. Um, for thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to be here. I'll introduce our two speakers. We're presenting Carl Jurgens and Marta Zimelis. Zimelis who are going to speak to us about Latvian literature, about translating Latvian literature and, and all the dimensions that that entails. Dr. Carl Jurgens, former English department head at the University of Windsor, is the author of four books uh, by Coach House, Mercury and ECW Presses. He has edited two books, one on painter Jack Bush and another book on the poet Christopher Dudney, plus an issue of Open Letter Magazine which he edited with me. His scholarly and creative works are published globally. Mr. Jurgens is has edited, was the publisher and editor of Rampike, an international journal of art, writing, and theory, which ran from 1979 to 2016. So almost 40 years. Rampike is, I must say, one of the most important Canadian literary magazines of, of, of of this century, of the past century. Rampike featured numerous Latvian and European writers in translation. His newest book of short fiction is due in 2022, so next year. Marta Ziamelis is a Toronto-based literary translator. She began translating from, English, from French into English, but now translates primarily Latvian to English. Marta's Latvian English translations include do You Exist or Did My Mind Invent You? A poem by Gunta Mikane in Translit, Volume 11, an anthology of literary translations. Two short stories in the anthology, The Book of Riga, Coma Press in 2018, and Narcosis, a poetry collection by Madara Gruntmane, translated by Richard, with Richard O'Brien, which was published recently in 2018. So without more ado, I'm going to ask the first question of our guests today. And I'm going to do it in a way in which we can get a little bit of an introduction to Latvian literature, which not all of us, I mean, I don't know very much about it. So I'm very, very interested in finding out. I'll start with Marta. Marta, to get us started, can I ask you to give us a brief overview of uh, Latvian literature and perhaps speak to us a little bit about its origins and some, and some of its history? Well, I think one thing that is very important to know is that a lot of Latvians think of themselves as poets, whether they actually write poetry or not. Um, there's a great deal of poetry in the Latvian tradition, which starts with the dynas, which are Latvian folk songs. And a lot of Latvians do write poetry as well. So that, that tradition is very strong and very contemporary. There's a lot of respect in you know, current Latvian literary circles for poets and for um, 
literary writers of all kinds. And um, just what else can I really say? We, we love to tell stories. <laughs> we love to tell stories. And I think that's one of really the main sources where the strong literary tradition comes from because that kind of, that just evolved from old tradition into people writing things down and um, composing things. Carl, you, you were saying um, that um, you were, re when we were exchanging emails about the event, you mentioned that it goes way back, Latvian literary history, can you give us a little bit of a, a sense of, of, of its evolve, ev evolution, per, perhaps? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, Marta is absolutely correct in mentioning the dinas, which are uh, folk songs that uh, predate the Christian period. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, Latvia was forcibly Christianized uh, around the uh, 1300s or 13th century, I should say. And um, they resisted mightily but, uh, and prior to that, they were what's called dievturigi, which means uh, a form of paganism that worships sky and earth and clouds and trees and thunder and birds and animals and things like that. And so a lot of the folk songs and folk tales relate to heroes as well as the elements of nature. And uh, at present, the uh, National Library in uh, Latvia, in Riga, the capital, has over 200,000 lyric songs that are intended for every possible occasion in life, including birth, death, marriage, you name it. Uh, and so everything is celebrated through this kind of oral tradition. And uh, if you look at some sites, um, they will say, well, the uh, original literature uh, started to form around the um, you know, 1900s or thereabouts. But that's, that's quite false. I mean, they had these Dina songs long before they were Christianized. And it's impossible to know how uh, far beyond uh, the, the 13th century uh, they, they began. Um, and so, you know, we've got, we've got this amazing ancient culture that goes all the way back to Sanskrit, which is one of the root languages of Latvian and Lithuanian because they're both Indo-European languages. And so, uh, Marta's point about the, the dinos is very important, I think. Has the language changed very much? I, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah lo lots of languages change over time as, as English has. Just think of uh, Chaucer mm -hmm. compared to 20th century English. Right, right. So, but those, those uh, oral, oral histories, that, that, uh, that tradition is, is understandable to a, a contemporary speaker. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's wonderful. That's very interesting. Yeah, because it's it's also a country that has undergone so so many invasions and expansions and shrinking and so forth. So the literature must reflect that as well, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, moving right along, <laughs> I think we'll get right into talking about your work. So. Marta, you, your mm -hmm. most recent translation is Madara Grutman is Narcosis, right? Maybe That's you can right. tell us a little bit about that book so that um, we can maybe even, even order it. Maybe you can uh, type in at the end uh, the, the name of the publisher and maybe we can access it to it somehow. But tell us a little Absolutely. bit about that, that, that book, yeah. I mean, from talking to Madara, I learned after reading this book that it's actually quite autobiographical, if not in specific details, then in the types of general experience. And what it does really is um, it talks about the kinds of everyday experiences that lots of women go through and in a very direct um, almost crass 
way sometimes she talks about love and heartbreak and sex and all of these things that people have been writing about forever um, but in a contemporary setting so it, she's a contemporary writer yes is she what generation would you say she is I can't remember her age right now, but um, she would have. She's probably in her forties, right? From what something, I can, yeah, yeah, something like that, forties or fifties, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Um, so, what are you working on right now? Right now, I am translating the second volume of Visma Belshevitz's Bela trilogy. And uh, so what tell us a little bit about that trilogy. Sure. Um, Visma was known as a translator, a poet and a political dissident. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that she's best known for is this trilogy of books about a girl called Bill. And the best way that I've found to describe it is that it's a kind of urban Latvian version of Anne of Green Gables. I see. And th this is a book that every kid in Latvia and probably everyone in the Latvian diaspora, you know, everywhere has heard of and has an opinion on. <laughs> That's congratulations. That's it. Sounds like it's quite a coup for a translation. Thank you. Although the first, volume one is still looking for an English language publisher, if anyone out there who's listening happens to be interested. <laughs> so volume two has been published in English translation. No, oh, none of them have been published yet. I've finished translating volume one. I'm still looking for a publisher for that. I'm somewhere in the middle of volume two right now. And what do you find it particularly challenging? I mean, or what what do you face as a particular challenge in this kind of translation, which is I assume fiction, right? Yes, fiction, that's right. I think something that applies to all Latvian literary translation that particularly applies to this project as well is that there's a lot of very Latvian specific cultural information that or cultural references that um, you know, a Latvian reader would just understand immediately and not need to have explained, but that I as a translator somehow have to explain in the English text without interrupting the flow of the story. Could could you read a little bit for us uh, from uh, from the work something you've chosen to 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 absolutely for today? This is from one of the stories I translated in the Book of Riga, which is a compilation of short stories about the capital city of Latvia. The story is called The Hare's Declaration, and it's originally by Jodis Zvirgsdijk. In short, I lost my job and didn't find a new one. Wherever I tried to worm my way in, sorry, you're just too old. The bank took away my house. My wife left me. My daughters, well, go reread King Lear or The Cat's Mill by our very own Cod Stald. That's how they acted. So then I decided to end it loudly. I'd slam the door on the void with a bang. But before my exit, I'd say everything that was on my mind and proudly. I didn't need the media, a TV debate, 
or some internet forum getting in my way. They can't silence me. I wandered aimlessly through Riga, looking for a place, the right place. The Freedom Monument? One guy already shot himself there. Does anyone still remember his name? The Vansha Bridge? Hmm. No, perhaps not. They tricked me into coming down. They have enough money in their budget for that, you see. They'd send a smart arse psychologist or the fireman. What about the Tower of St. Peter's Church? The correct choice, sir. Congratulations. That evening, with a backpack on my shoulders and a ticket in hand, I rode the lift to the tower's viewing platform. I listened a moment while a guide explained something to a group of Japanese tourists. Then I crept off behind them, up the metal stairs to the platform above, to be closer to the golden rooster weather vane and to God. I spent the night in a sleeping bag. In the morning, I stood at the edge of the platform and, in order to attract attention, started waving my arms in the air. At first, only one passerby raised their head, then another and another. Soon enough, a fairly large crowd of people had gathered below. A police car pulled up, then a fire engine, and a crane, striped tape, was stretched out around the base of the tower. I took the notepad containing my speech out of my backpack and raised my hand in greeting. I opened my mouth and I could only whisper. My throat had closed up. I must have caught a cold sleeping on the stone floor. I tore the page out of my notepad, folded it into a paper airplane and released it into the air. Spiraling, my declaration glided downward. A tall police officer jumped up and caught it. His commanding officer yanked the paper out of his hand, looked at it, and folding it carefully, stuffed it in the pocket of his uniform. He gave his subordinates an order. They formed a chain and shifted the crowd farther away from the church. Neither public outrage nor eagerly flashed press IDs were any good. The police let no one near. So there I stood, waving my arms like a ghost, tearing pages from my notepad, scribbling this and that, then folding them into paper airplanes before throwing them into the crowds below. A few ended up in the cops' clutches. Spectators collected others, and that was it. Nothing happened. No revolution began. One after another, officials and psychologists tried to talk me down. A unit of men in bulletproof vests tried to storm the tower, but my handmade poster near the platform, landmines, stopped them. And then they eventually got bored of trying. Even the helicopter didn't help. Its blades got tangled in electrical wires, and it crash landed next to the Lima clock, flattening the Lamborghini parked there. There were no casualties thank God, and the car, unfortunately, was insured. <laughs> That's wonderful. It sounds like a really fun book to read, actually. Is it? The story is very funny and very strange, and I highly recommend that you get this book so you can finish it and read all of the other beautiful stories from Riga. So tell me, Sorry. when was this trilogy written? Around what period? The Billa trilogy? Yeah, the one that you just read from. Oh no, this, this, the book came Oh no, out that's what you're working on. This particular is an excerpt from, from, an, from a book, right? This is an excerpt from a short story that's part of a compilation of short stories. Wonderful. By different authors. I don't know. It's an anthology. Yeah. Yes, exactly. An anthology. Very interesting. Um, beautifully translated, by the way. Thank you. So I think it's your turn, Carl. Um, so my question to you is, um, 
you've done a lot for translation. Obviously, you've published a lot of translation, but you've also translated literature, uh, and I'm sure not just Latvian literature. So how did you get involved in translating Latvian literature, and um, like, where are you at with that now? Well, um, thanks for asking, and uh, thanks for organizing this event, and to you and Alex, and and to Marta and everybody who is here. And thanks to the uh, Three Fires Confederacy of Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, where I'm speaking from. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I grew up in a Latvian family in Toronto, and uh, um, I'm an autodidact as far as the language and the writing and the reading goes. Uh, in other words, I taught myself, um, partly because my parents insisted that I, I learn the language. Um, my mom also wanted me to learn Russian, but um, I, I, uh, I wasn't sure why. And she says, well, you should always know the language of your enemy, <laughs> which cracked me up. And then I refused because uh, it only got me in trouble in kindergarten when uh, I would answer da instead of yes. And, and so um, those were weird times. But anyway, so I, I, I translated a, a bunch of stuff from Latvian. Uh, and I, I got interested in the um, survivor stories of the Gulag, which were similar to the survivor stories of the Holocaust, uh, the terrible Holocaust that happened in Nazi Germany. And I found a parallel to that in uh, uh, the Gulag. And uh, there, there's a big debate about that as to how many died there. But um, one of the uh, authors that I, I chose to translate was Alexander Pellatz. Um, and here are two of his books. Uh, one's called the Siberia book, and the other one's uh, uh, a bastardized version of that, uh, Armelno Vey, which is extremely censored, and it was censored by his own um, publisher, because they were terrified that uh, they would uh, get reprisals from the Soviets, even though by then, in 1991, Latvia was already free. Uh, but they were horrified, and this is just the kind of mental habit that they got into. Better not do that because we don't know what's going to happen next. We might all end up in the gulag, that kind of thing. And so uh, I tracked uh, what happened to Alexander Pellatz for 23 years uh, in the gulag, and he wrote this book about it. And I was able to uh, correspond with him uh, by phone and by email and by letter. Uh, and uh, I was interested in that because my uncle also died there on my father's side, and he uh, used to send us letters from the gulag, which were folded into little triangles. Um, I don't know if I can make a triangle here. Yeah, like little triangles of paper that uh, they would fold uh, up because they couldn't afford paper over there and they would uh, ship it out. And then, and then somebody in uh, Riga would ship that over to us and pay the postage. And so we would read these horrible little letters about, can you please send food? Uh, and they're all dying because of uh, what's called the exquisite diet, which was slightly less than a human being needs per day to stay alive. And uh, they would feed them that, like it would be the form of gruel, uh, a type of uh, porridge. Uh, and so we got these letters and we would send things like um, rice and macaroni over there, but it never reached my uncle because um, I think the guards swiped the stuff, you know, they just ate it themselves. And so uh, as a result, I was uh, fascinated by that whole kind of abuse where men, women, and children were attacked. And it was uh, every, every imaginable social group. Uh, they had gypsies, they had Jews, they had Christians, it didn't matter. And there was a whole United Nations there of people that were imprisoned uh, for a long time, uh, even after Stalin's death, when, the, when all of that uh, gulag stuff became uh, completely irrelevant. And um, none of it is really acknowledged now because um, what they did was they bulldozed over most of them, unlike what happened with Eisenhower when he walked into the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. He says, I got to document this right away because people will never believe it and there will be Holocaust deniers later on. Uh, whereas with uh, the Soviet system, because they were allies, that never got documented. So Pelatsis is one of the survivors who actually talks about what it was like inside the system, along with others like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, which I think some people have heard of. Yes, absolutely. It's horrifying. Yeah, so I, I got into that. And more lately, uh, I've done uh, uh, translations 
of an experimental nature, including for the one you invited me on uh, for Ellipse Magazine, where I translated uh, people like uh, BP Nickel, Nicole Brassard, Chris Dudney, uh, Claude Beausoleil, and Michel Delisle for Ellipse Magazine. And uh, thanks for inviting me. But I, I, I translated them into visual images, kind of experimental, semaphore, Morse code, and stuff like that. And I showed it to Nicole Brassard, who was who loved it. She thought this was great. She liked the colors. She liked the fact that her poetry was being translated into semaphore of all things. And uh, with BP Nichols' piece, I I translated using a, a strange typography uh, that comes into uh, uh, yeah very experimental format. Anyway, uh, you'll have to wait for the Ellipse magazine. Well, and it'll come yeah. out in, in in the fall, but. Um... And it's it's a, it's a, an ex extraordinary piece, and I hope that everybody will buy a leaps or will go to the the site where a leaps will be published. That issue will be published, right? At this time, a leaps is already up on the on the association's website, so you can, for those who are who are interested, you can look at the uh, current issues, um, and perhaps Alex can can type in the um, the link on the on the dialog boxes. But tell me a little bit about um, actually what what it what it involved translating these these works that are so charged for you. They must be very difficult to translate at an emotional level, and perhaps also at, 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 there are things that that must be challenging to translate at, at a linguistic level too, right? Yeah, I, I listed. Um, uh, I, I have I have seven challenges that I've thought about in the past. Uh, that I faced when uh, when doing translations. One is question of time. It just takes time and energy. Uh, it's also a, a kind of interpretation, uh, as Baudelaire demonstrated when he translated the poetry of Edgar Allan Poe. Some say his translations were better than the originals. Um, translating Latvian writing means we're thrown into a history of violent conflict, wars of words, arguments over historical contexts, and uh, an attempt to murder the memories of things that happened in the past. Um, on lesser levels, there are things like dialects. My mom grew up in uh, Daugavpils, or uh, otherwise used to be known as Dvinsk, uh, which is where Rothko was born, the famous painter. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they speak a dialect over there called Latgalian or Latgale. Uh, and um, just to give you a little bit of example, in uh, English, you could say, I don't have. In Latvian, you may, might say man now, and in Latgalian, say ash naturu. <laughs> so it's, it's radically different, you know. And you go, huh? What What are they talking about? Also, there there are slang problems. Uh, for example, in Latvian, they might say sabiesinatus crassus, which comes out of Pelas's book, which literally means thick in colors. But that's not what they mean. They don't mean thick in colors. Uh, they're referring to exaggeration. So to find the, the right wording for something like that, you might see something like laying it on thick, you know, right. which kind of makes sense and it still has that feeling, you know. Then there were uh, subtle satiric meanings that were embedded in a lot of uh, writing from uh, the sort of post-Soviet period or during the Soviet period, uh, where there are subtle satiric meanings embedded because they're trying to get past the censors. And they're terrified that the censors are going to ship them off to the gulag, and they will meet their death there. Um, uh, I think one of my one of my uh, colleagues, Violeta Kalertis, mentioned that uh, Lithuanian writers uh, who are allied to Latvians adopted allegory, magic realism, complex subtext, and irony in order to mask their statements. And I think that that uh, works equally well for the Latvian and the Estonian writers of the time. Uh, one of the problems was communicating with the author over great distances, whether you use mail, letter, or email. And um, I guess the big one was censorship. Uh, censorship was the big problem because of the uh, something like nearly 389 pages of, of um, his original Siberia book. This one came out really thin and was reduced to about 180 pages. And I'll give you, a, a, if, if you have a minute, I'd like to read a short portion of uh, the part that was actually censored, just to give you an idea of what was censored. Oh, please, please read to us. This yes. only takes two minutes. I timed it ahead, just in case. And this this was cut out because they were afraid that that it it, it pointed the 
you know, the finger at the wrong people. And it's called the death of Anatole Korolev's kingdom. Uh, and, and they said, well, you can't have a death of a kingdom, first off. You can have a death of a person. They didn't understand that. They just didn't get it. Okay, so here it is. Anatole Korolev, a pretty boy, served as the dentist for the prison keepers. He gained influence and respect. Other prison keepers would come for miles uh, around to Anatole's dental services. He, meantime, he bragged about his lovemaking in Paris. And once when in the sauna, he bragged about his lovemaking with one of the warden's favored women. Caught in the act with her, he was taken down a step. He was told to join the regular workers. News traveled like lightning. To join the regular work de detail had a special meaning. In those days, an individual was selected once at the beginning of each month and shot as an example so that others would live in fear. An excuse for the execution was always easy to find. Some regulation had been broken. According to the Hague Convention, Anatole was technically not allowed to be punished in this way because he was a medical specialist, a dentist. But that didn't apply here. It was the first of the month. A guard armed with an automatic weapon asked him to stand just outside the electric fence. Then he was warned three times to try not to try to escape. The fact that he stood still was immaterial. The rules of the Hague Convention had to be followed. After the three warnings were issued, the guard emptied his cartridge with 32 rounds into the body of Anatole Korolev. Fewer bullets would have done the job just as well but with a person of Korolev's high standing, there was no skimping. He was then taken for autopsy. Three bullets were found in his brain and he was pronounced dead. The woman that he had an affair with was ordered to cut off his penis and preserve it in a jar of alcohol. I'm not as inhuman as I look, the commander explained. Now you can regard it whenever you feel like it. Anatole was then buried in the prisoner's graveyard. His lover was with child and she was promoted to lieutenant after following orders. Fedya, one of the prison guards, drank the alcohol base in which the penis was kept and unceremoniously dumped the member onto a dung heap. Back in Latvia, Anatole's wife was informed that he had died from perturbations of the heart. The local doctor that signed the coroner's report uh, hadn't even performed the autopsy. <laughs> so this wow. is the kind of stuff that went on over there and they just didn't they didn't think they could share that with the general public and they were terrified there would be reprisals if they told those kind of stories outside of, uh, you know, the experience of being in the gulag, so. That's pretty extreme, huh? Yeah, well, that's just one of many examples. I mean, there are suicides with uh, women, uh, you know, uh, Marta was talking about, you know, women's rights and, and things like that. And there's a very strong feminist uh, angle in there too. Um, there were women being raped in, uh, in, the, in the gulag. Children were being eaten alive uh, by rats and dogs. Um, it, was, it was horrible over there. Women would come tearing out of uh, um, the guards' barracks and throw themselves against the electric fence uh, to commit suicide so they wouldn't be raped. And uh, they would refuse to turn off the fence because that would mean they'd have to put out the lights until morning and they didn't want to do that. And so the, the, the body would be up there vibrating on the electric wire until morning, a kind of, uh, that's an episode that Pellas describes as the Fatima of the Gulag. So yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that going on. So yeah, getting into that headspace was a little tricky and it was one of the challenges that I had to face. Hey, are, you, are, you, are you interested in publishing these, these kinds of? Um... Well, some of it's already been published. Uh, I, I published um, not only uh, some translations from Pellas's writing, uh, the Siberia book, uh, in, in places like Descant magazine and Rampike and others, but I also uh, published them in scholarly works uh, where they were also, uh, I also did other translations of things like um, folk stories, uh, which were about critters like the devil. But uh, the thing you have to understand is the devil stories were more like trickster tales. Uh, they weren't like about Satan. They were about sort of dummy heads that messed things up. And they were a lot like uh, the indigenous uh, Nana Buju or Wasiga Jack or uh, uh, Raven or other indigenous uh, uh, tricksters of that ilk uh, because um, they would mess things up and they would get confused and they were easily fooled. 
and uh, they're, they're, filled, they're filled with kind of witty things. For example, a farmer might say, uh, okay, he, he might say, well, I'm making beer now. And the, and the devil would come up and say, I want to know how to make beer. And he'd go, well, you can't make beer unless you've got rye and you need hops too. And he goes, oh, well, you know, or whiskey, it doesn't matter, vodka. And uh, he'd say, okay, uh, well, what are you going to make next year? And he says, I'm going to make vodka. He says, what do you need for that? And he says, potatoes. He goes, oh, okay, potatoes. I want, I want in on that. He says, okay, listen, next year, I'm going to plant potatoes. You get the top of the harvest and I get the bottom, which means he gets all the potatoes and the devil gets nothing but the greens on the top. And then the <laughs> devil tries to brew the greens into a, a booze and it doesn't work. So the farmer comes up behind him in his den underground and whacks him on the head with a big spoon. And he goes, whoa, that's got a good kick on it. <laughs> and he, goes, <laughs> he drinks another one. He goes, bam, whacks him again. And he goes, oh, this stuff's pretty good. <laughs> And so there are all these ridiculous stories, you know, there's folk tales about uh, the devils and how they got into mischief. And really they are representations of uh, foreign colonialists who have come in and they're, the, the, the Latvian locals are just trying to uh, outwit them and take advantage of them and, and get around them somehow because they're the ones that are pushing their weight around uh, in, in colonial fashion. And so a lot of the stories have that sort of political bent and, and there's a lot of wit and, and funniness going on too. So it wasn't all just about stuff like the gulag. And uh, you know some of the gulag stories have, have their own funny parts too. I can tell them about those later. Okay. Well, this is, a, this is a, it's what, what you've uh, worked on for a long time, I can, I can see, is, is, pretty, is pretty vast. I mean, there's so many dimensions to, to to that literature, I mean, there is subversion in, in humor and so forth. So, and that that obviously comes through, right? Yeah. So um, we're going. I mean, we're doing so well with time. We're going to talk a little bit about the challenges of trend of publishing literary translation. I mean, translation of works from other countries in Canada. So from languages that are. I mean, many, many of many Canadian writers write in other languages, but the difficulty for us in Canada is to find publishers that can that will publish our work if they are not uh, translations of Canadian works. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I'm going to ask Marta to tell me a little bit about this because you know I I I see a person like Marta who is I think in her twenties. Not that I want to talk about age too much, but you know, and as sort of when I started to translate, and uh, now I'm not in my 20s, obviously, a lot of years have passed and nothing has changed. So I was wondering, Marta, what kinds of challenges are you finding? Like, tell us a little bit about your story, because as a person who is so done, doing something with some, you're working so much, you, you're translating a trilogy, you're translating stories, poetry, and where do you publish? How do you do that? What do you do? Well, I've been thinking about what I would like to see changing on the Canadian literary scene in terms of us as translators being able to publish more translations in Canada. And first of all, it would be nice to have that scene just acknowledge a little more than it's doing right now that translation is actually an art you know and a craft of its own apart from writing the original kind of spotlight that a little more and along with that to have and i have no idea of the details of how this could be made to work, but what I would like to see is some sort of dedicated funding from all of the arts grants that are out there that would be um, committed to translations annually so that more Canadian publishers would be able to publish translations of work that perhaps isn't 
originating from Canada itself, because that would only open up wider possibilities to Canadian readers, which in my mind is a good thing. Yeah, like my, my feeling is that Canadian writing would benefit a lot from from this kind of exposure to other other kinds of rhythms and images and stories, right? Okay. Uh, and we would stop labeling, you know, using huge, you know, just one type of literature that got translated a lot and published a lot in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And then we're still, everybody's still referring to that stuff, you know, be, because what you're doing, you're translating contemporary literature mm -hmm. and there's there's probably a lot of crossover that could happen between those our literatures and and Latvian literature. Yeah, I expect there could be. We would just need to have enough Latvian literature, yeah, translated in Canada or and accessible to Canadians. That's for right. That to be able to happen. Yeah. No, I've always imagined that Canada could be a center, you know, of Can a publishing of international literature because there's mm -hmm. so many really great translators here and and I I meet somebody like you I hear you speak and I think wow somebody like Marta is really breaking new ground here you know um so yeah it's it's like a, a gold mine really of of the imagination and um how how do you how do you see yourself as a translator do you see yourself as, as an author or how do you see your role at times? Does it fluctuate between being a kind of person who transfers from the tar from the original to the target, or do you see yourself more as a creator? How do you how do you find those roles playing out for you? I think that I see myself at different times as both an interpreter and a kind of creator because in my mind, what I'm doing is taking the original text and just rewriting it in this other language. Mm -hmm. And of course I try, I try to remain as faithful to the spirit of the original as I can, but, but there are, things that have to change between languages that go beyond grammatical structure. And that's where the rewriting and interpretation comes in. Exactly, yeah. And, and there's a lot of that, right? There's a lot of rewriting, isn't there? When you're, when you're preparing a text for publication, right? I would say so, especially because in the case of Latvian and English, they have in my experience, very different grammatical structures. Latvian loves long sentences with lots and lots of clauses. And that um, doesn't always work well, literally in English. So there has to, there's a lot of reshaping that I have to do sometimes. Right, the syntax is completely mm -hmm. different. Yeah, yeah. So Carl, is, um, you, you've been a champion of Liter international literature and translation in the 40 years that you published uh, Rampike, for sure. I mean, it was a home for a lot of that work. Tell us a little bit about some of the some of the work you translate you you published in Rampike. Tell us a little bit about Rampike because a lot of a lot of our audience doesn't know. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah. Um, first, first, I'll say a little bit about um, the uh, the connections with. Uh, um, translating people from other cultures. So for example, um, uh, I, I recently was helping uh, get Benedict Toth uh, published and he did, uh, he worked through Biblioasis bookstore uh, and books uh, and he just had his novel published called Dead Heat. And uh, it's about competitive swimmers, but it's really, really rude and uh, really contemporary and full of all kinds of uh, obscenities and things like that. But uh, it won the Margot Prize in Hungary. Uh, and so it did really well. And one of the ways that um, Biblioasis has made its bread and butter is to publish really good translations. 
And so there are some small publishers here and there that do that. And so I, I know Ellie, thanks for the thumbs up. Uh, yeah, um, they will uh, occasionally uh, publish books by um, people from other nations and in other languages if they're well translated. And the uh, translation by Benedict Toth's uh, Dead Heat is by Ildiko Nomi Nagi, and she did a brilliant job. So like what you need is a combination of a really good translation and uh, a really interesting or breakthrough uh, uh, novel or book or something like that. Uh, individual short stories are a lot easier to publish. And, and so that's, that's not as complicated. And so what I did with uh, Rampike Magazine um, and I'm going to put a, a link up here. Um, you, can, you can get uh, the entire 1979 to 2016 series for free online. Um, and uh, you just get the link there uh, from the chat line if you want. And if you forget what it is, just uh, Google about Rampike and then click on the university button and you're in for free. So uh, no charge and everybody can take a look at it. Um, but I, I was uh, fortunate enough to have uh, editors from around the world, including uh, my Boston editor, James Gray. He was a really excellent uh, uh, coordinator and he provided me with lots and lots of uh, international uh, people that uh, I was able to translate. And once that got rolling, I was able to translate a bunch of my own stuff too. So for example, I was able to translate uh, Joseph Boyce, who's the uh, famous uh, German artist, Jacques Ferron, uh, who was the founder of the Rhino Party in Canada, Takis, a uh, super, superstar of art in uh, France, uh, Clarisse Lispector, I don't know if you know her work. Brazilian, yeah, she's super, Brazilian. Yeah. Super famous. She was translated by Alexis Levitin, and uh, she her, her first novel, uh, Near to the Wild Heart, was an absolute breakthrough of 20th century uh, literature. I've also published Ray Ellenwood's translations of Claude Gavreau's The Exformidable Moose, Aaron Moray's translations of Maria de, de Sebrero, Michelle Serez, translated by Genevieve James, um, and uh, not to mention Philippe Soler, who was translated by Elaine Quartz. Uh, Soler is an interesting guy. Uh, he was part of the uh, Telkel group, which included Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Julia Kristeva, Jacques Lacan, and others of that sort. So it was just a big lucky break to get him. And uh, I was very happy. He, he, he published uh, a lot of the stuff from his novel, Ash, which is the letter H only. And uh, it, it has, speaking of long sentences, Marta, uh, he had interminable sentences. Like the entire page would be maybe just one sentence. <laughs> and it would drive people crazy. And like really super long sentences, but uh, absolutely brilliant writing, I thought. And Derrida was interesting too. He gave a talk. This is apocryphal. I don't know if this is entirely true, but he gave a talk in Irvine, California at the university down there. And he kept talking about cows. And he was saying how cows change the meaning of literature and how uh, philosoph philosophy is changed by cows and la la la. And this just went on. And then he finally took a break to uh, have a drink of water. And then he was gonna come back and read the second half. And, and one of the uh, representatives there said, what's this all about the cows? We don't understand. We, we were completely puzzled by your references to cows. And, and he goes, well, here's the word right here. And he goes, oh, chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so like, he, he just didn't get it, you know? And, and so it was funny. I've had um, Alicia Berinsky and Saul Yurkovich translated by um, Kola Franza, Niels Hav translated by Per Brask, uh, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, uh, he was self-translated, Nicole Broussard self-translated. I've also had uh, experimental stuff like BP Nichols Probable Systems 22, uh, which is about translation and a system of translational methodologies that were published in uh, the Pataphysics issue 5.2 and was a continuation of a very rare but much cited article that he wrote on how translation works. So anybody who wants to know about contemporary translation models can check out that it's in it's in Rampike, and as I say, it's all free. Yay! So you don't have to uh, you don't have to pay to get at stuff. And so uh, to uh, echo what Marta said about how you get this stuff out, it's a lot of it has to do with just 
sometimes you just got to do it yourself. So I did this crazy magazine for many years and I just put my nose to the shoulder, uh, my nose to the grind wheel and put my shoulder to the wheel and just pushed, you know, it was hard work. I didn't enjoy doing it, but you know, somebody does it. And thanks to you uh, for this uh, Zoom series too. I, I know it's not easy to do this, but it's one way of getting the message out. And so um, the uh, Translator Society is, uh, you know, to be commended for this sort of thing. So thank you. Well, uh, so far, uh, a lot of times you just got to do it yourself and uh, otherwise it's not going to get done. No, for sure. That's, that's what we do, right? Well, that's how publishing, like, like, that's how anything gets started in, in, in anywhere, even, I mean, especially in Canada, you have to kind of make it happen because it wasn't here before, right? Um, it's, it's worse now with the pandemic because uh, now uh, it seems like writers have to promote their own stuff. Whereas before you could count on the publisher to promote it a little bit. Whereas now uh, it's like almost entirely up to the writer and it's, it's just very difficult to do that. It's, yeah. uh, it's like, you gotta be on the internet like half of the day, every single day, just promoting the, the heck out of yourself. And it's, it's not fun. No, it's, it's not fun and it's not good that it's, it has to be that way. Um, I wanted to show the, um, the cover of the two issues of Rampike that I have handy so that people can see them. This is what they look like. These are pretty old. Um, I think we should, we're running out of time. So I was gonna, are there any questions um, that people wanna ask uh, our wonderful speakers today, Marta or Carl? I haven't seen any questions on the, um, on the dialog box, are there? Well, during the I, gap, uh, while people are preparing yes. questions, uh, and they may indeed, uh, I'll just mention a few of the Latvians that I've had the good fortune of publishing. I've, I've published uh, Arvids Ulme, Juris Kronbergs, Mara Zalite, Alexander Pelatsis, Andre Neberga, Andra Neberga, Waltz Kleins. That was the cover of there. That was a Waltz Klein cover, and Guido Kions, among many others. And so, uh, yeah, I've had, I've had uh, a good luck publishing them, not to mention. Uh, Latvian Canadians such as Banyuta Rubes, Larissa Kostov, Modris Ecksteins, and uh, Baltic writers such as Yuri Talvet, Violeta Kalertas, Estonian and Lithuanian, as well as Baltic Canadians such as Antona Shuleka and Leonard Cohen, uh, who happened to be Lithuanian. I don't know if people realize that, but his background is Lithuanian. There you go. And I've, I've had the good fortune of publishing him in Rampike. Holy smokes, eh? <laughs> Oh, you, you've done an incredible job. Um, how many how many volumes did you publish? 37? I can't remember. I just know I did it for a long time. From 2016, I started off doing three a year, and then I said, this is too hard. I'm going to switch to two a year. And after about five years, I switched to two. So I don't know. You can do the math if you like. I just lost track. I'll, 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 yeah, somebody, a good bibliographer should do that. Yeah. So, okay. So um, there was a question from Elio, right? Or No. She put up her hand, I saw that. <laughs> okay, um, let me formulate my question. I feel like I'm amongst such incredibly intelligent and accomplished authors, but in your advertising, you said something about uh, views of uh, the Latvian view of North American society or North American writers. And I was just wondering what some of the views are of, um, of, you know, coming from Latvia, what are some of the views of North Americans? Did I misread something there or? No, that was that was right. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. and I, I didn't mean to mislead too much, but uh, there is a kind of a Latvian mindset. And I think Marta knows about this too. Uh, if you come in, you're, you're automatically an outsider. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how mm -hmm. well <laughs> uh, integrated you are with society. And I think most uh, Europeans who have come to North America will have this experience. It doesn't, it's not exclusively Latvian. I know my dad was a white man who got a job in a uh, construction company when he was uh, younger uh, and he tried to murder him because uh, he wasn't the right kind of white guy. As soon as he opened his mouth, they could tell he spoke uh, English very differently and they tried to kill him uh, and make it look like an accident on the, uh, construction site. So that'll be in my next novel, among other things. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I thought that was interesting because, you know, as a Hungarian 
having been born in Hungary and everything, I um, one of the words that they use in Hungary for anybody who isn't Hungarian is idegen. You're, you are a stranger. You are yeah. idegen. And what was really interesting is even though I was Hungarian and I was I was born, I was self-isolating there and traveling there, um, I was considered idegen, even though I'm, you know, a citizen and I grew up in a Hungarian household. But I did, and I felt idegen. I felt strange. And uh, it was interesting. And I think, um, I think that's, as you said, with many European cultures. And I do remember growing up wanting to be Canadian, whatever mm -hmm. that meant, because we were the different kind of white guy. Yeah, maybe Marta can say something about this, yeah. but I know my parents were labeled DPs, displaced persons. Yes, 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 yeah. Right. And, oh, and so, yeah, we were DPs. You know, so your parents too. must have got this, eh, Marta? Yeah. My, my grandparents did. I yeah. My family's case, because they were the generation who first mm -hmm. came to Canada. So, Marta, when did your grandparents come to Canada? In the 1940s, during the war, they didn't really have a choice. Right, right, right. And, and the funny thing is, when you uh, have that experience, if, if it's from your parents, for example, you get a, they get post-traumatic stress disorder from that, and they suffer from that, and they pass it on to their kids. So I've got it now. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying not to pass it on to my son. It's, it's not really easy to do. Yeah. And I, I, I can yeah. feel it. Like, I can feel it when I do translations of the gulag and, you know, the horrors that happen there. I'm, I'm re-experiencing this, it's, it's, it's miserable. And uh, I'm trying not to pass it on to my son. He's born in Canada and uh, he's, uh, he's, he's sort of outside of that, but he can feel it coming from me. It's like, it's like this aura of horror. <laughs> oh, it's so true. And you know, it's interesting because I was, um, so, so many of our people here in Canada have families. We were torn asunder we did not have the grandparents. We saw them, but they would be looking at us and we'd be looking at them. And there was never any real communication because we didn't want to be the old fashioned Hungarians that they were. And they just thought we were corrupt North Americans. Well, that's, right? that's, that's the sort of the legacy of, well, that's the sort, that's the, um, the destiny, let's call it. With, of people who have who came here, mm -hmm. or even our first generation Canadians, but especially those who came from a, from elsewhere, they don't belong here and they don't belong where they came from. You know, yeah. that's the yeah. problem. Yeah. You don't have roots in either place very much. So you got to figure out how to make your own roots somehow, right? In your work or or in your art or in whatever you do. That's yeah. The only way that one can move forward. I think that's why I find it so important that that this dialogue happens because translation is is so much part of this process of going back and forth and and dealing with loss and and gains. It's 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 a wonderful possibility, but it's very tormented. It can be very tormented depending on what what you you translate. And these literatures are very tormented literatures because of the history behind them. Yeah, you have to learn. Uh, it, it's, I see uh, uh, Diana has a question up. Uh, I, so I'll make this comment very short. Um, if, if you can identify with uh, people who are outsiders, uh, then you have a better chance of uh, working on rural suffering and uh, improving levels of compassion. One example I just put up on... Uh, the uh, chat line was from Agatha Nessal, who, uh, who wrote a book, uh, A Woman in Amber, and it, its uh, subtext is Healing the Trauma of War and Exile. It, it was published by New York by Penguin of all presses. It's very famous. It won the American Book Award, and she's a Latvian who was translated into English. I've written about her stuff in scholarly mags, and I had to translate some of it for there. Um, but uh, there, that, that's that. She's just a, an example of somebody who does exactly what you just said. So I think Deanna had a question. That, Deanna, Deanna, uh, yeah, you've done a lot of translation, and you've you you've promoted a lot of translation from this former Soviet bloc. What is your question? 
Well, thank you. First, I want to thank you for organizing this and to thank uh, Carl and Marta. And if I may, I will be fast. I remember, Carl, I got an email from you probably in 2016. I submit him, submitted some work to Rampai and I got an email from you telling me that the magazine is not going to exist anymore. I, I just remember that. Yeah, I sorry. Have a, that's okay. I couldn't keep going. <laughs> yeah, you explained that in the email. I, I am Romanian born, as uh, many of you know here, and I can totally relate to all the uh, things you, you mentioned about, you know, dictatorships and censorship and uh, uh, things like that. I have a question which comes from a personal, I'm curious. I totally, I can, I understand Marta said that uh, about the sentences, the syntax that is different in Latvian. And of course I can, and the cultural differences and I can relate to that. I was wondering, uh, these big things of, aside, like the differences between language, the linguistic differences and the cultural differences, how do you perceive the differences between authors in the same language. Mm. Do okay. I make sense? What a good question. Ex excellent question. I, I'm curious. I'm just very curious. Maybe, I, both, of, maybe both Marta and <laughs> Carl can, yes. can answer. Yeah, um, I just, if I just made, uh, made, so I translated mainly poetry from Romanian, but mm -hmm. recently I ended up because no one else wanted to do it because it was very, very difficult. I've translated three plays, three Roma plays, Romani plays written mm. in Romanian about uh, uh, Roman, Romani women, the, you know, the absolute complete lack of rights of women in uh, traditional Roma communities in Romania. So, and it was a nightmare to translate a play written in a Romanian dialect about the Roma community. And it felt a breeze to translate Romanian poets in comparison, regardless of their style. So thank you so much. Yeah, good question. Marta, you want to say something about that? Sure. Marta, maybe you go first, yeah. I think taking Vizma Belshevitz as an, as an example, because she's the first one that comes to mind. Um, when, you, when you read her writing, it flows very smoothly. It's beautiful. It's almost melodic, very vivid. And you think, oh, that must be easy to work with. It's so lovely. But then you go into the structure of it and find out you realize how carefully she put together every single little word. So you can't just, I can't just breeze through it. I have to take the same kind of care putting together sentences. And then you have someone like Madara who wrote Narcosis, who writes in a very conversational style, very everyday conversational, so that I don't really have to struggle. Well, struggle is the wrong word, but let's say struggle. Struggle is much with that. It's, that's much more thinking, well, how would I say something like this in a conversation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carl, what do you think? I think that uh, you hit the nail on the head there, Marta. Uh, there's a fluidity that seems to carry over from writer to writer in the Latvian uh, uh, pieces that I've read. And um, I think that uh, they have found, uh, or they seem to be writing in a style that many have in, in recent times described as postmodern. And I'm not sure why they do that. They, they just seem to naturally do that. They have longer sentences, they have asides, they, they move uh, from one idea to another in a very fluid, natural way. Um, I would call it associational thinking as opposed to linear logical thinking. Um, one idea leads to another idea, leads to another idea, leads to another idea. It's almost surreal. Um, and it, it has that uh, kind of feeling to it. 
Um, I, find, I feel it entering into my own writing when I work on my own fiction. And I, I, I know that uh, sometimes Beatrice asks me this question. She says, how does translating affect your own writing? And yeah, that's how it, it, it seems natural. It just comes into my own writing style as if I'm still Latvian. I still think in Latvian sometimes. And um, my brain just goes there. I, I don't know why. It's just the associational model as opposed to the linear logical one. So, and okay. I mean, we're, we're sort of out close to ending, but I wanted to finish with this tiny question for you, Carl, that I don't, I don't want to leave it. Um, your interest in, in, in the avant-garde and your own work as a, as a, as a very innovative writer, uh, does that come from your, 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 your inheritance from Latvian? Is that something that, how, how do you see that in your own uh, trajectory as an author? Yeah, that's a good question. I think maybe Marta can understand this one too. Um, one of the things that uh, I found was that as an outsider, uh, you're always looking at things in a different way. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, you can write from this outsider's point of view. And that always reshapes my writing in, in a peculiar way uh, that is uh, not the standard writing style anymore. Uh, I, I can't write like that. I just, I just can't. It's not in me. I don't know why. Um, and so I, I, I jump into an associational writing style immediately as soon as I put, you know, pen to page. Uh, I, I can't get out of it. Um, and yeah, so it's a really good question. Uh, it, it, I think it comes from, like, I've always asked myself, is it genetic? <laughs> is, it, is it part of my DNA code? Or, or is it just something I picked up along the way? Is it because of the way my parents told me stories when I was a little kid? Is it because I've read a lot over my lifetime and including translation works? I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, but it's a really good question. It's a good one. I would have to think about that. And to finish, to finish, Marta, for you, for you, the um, you, you're you're a writer in your own right. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that translation has shaped you in some fashion as a as a as a as a writer who is exploring your own writing as your beginning in a way? I mean, I'm you're not that you're not a novice, but um, no, I'm 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 emerging. Let's so that's a good so, term. So how do you, do you find that it has influenced you, your own writing in English? Not as much as I might imagine, at least not directly. But now that I think about it, um, perhaps it makes me pay more attention to the way that I put words together because I find that having to be some something I consider very carefully when I'm translating. So um, maybe not in my first drafts of my own writing, but when I go over them to change things in a redraft 50 times as you do, then I will, will be more likely to consider the exactly the way things go together and why they go together that way. I think like the, the craft of translating has kind of trained me into doing that. Thank you very much. So we're going to, unless there are more questions, I think we're sort of out of time, but we can take one more, but I think there are none. So we're going to close. I'm going to thank Marta Zimelis and uh, Carl Jurgens for their fantastic fantastic participation. I think that you really, you, we've done something that doesn't happen very much, which is spoken about not just the literature that many of us should know about, but taken it into all kinds of directions and covered centuries and covered emotions and the way in which interconnectedness hap connectedness happens, not just in the literary, but in the culture and in the social. So, Thank you very, very much for such an engaging conversation. And I'd like to thank again, the Literary Translators Association of Canada for their support. And I'd like to thank all of you who attended. It really is very generous of you in this age of over Zoom. So thank you very much and we'll see you again. <laughs>